Hello and welcome and thanks for tuning in. You're watching Vion World is One with me, Priyanka Sharma. And this is our weekly special broadcast of the Vion VOA co-production where we look at some of the biggest news developments coming out of America and how they impact the world. Our top focus, one year after the complete U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Taliban spokesperson Zabihullah Mujahid sat down with Voice of America. We begin this broadcast with some crucial excerpts from this interview. Listen in. Afghanistan has been a war-torn country. Mafia has ruled. People were looting each other. Such was a state of lawlessness that no part of Kabul was safe from lawlessness. After one year, all our actions have come to the conclusion that the situation in Afghanistan has completely changed at this time. All roads are open. People travel day and night. The law and order situation in Kabul has returned to normal. Recently, many incidents have been claimed by the extremist organization Daesh. What would you say about this? During the last one year, more than 1,200 Daesh militants have been arrested. Around 600 have been killed. Around 200 centers have been destroyed. Now they are in a weak condition. Sometimes they detonate by installing explosives on the green belt, and sometimes it's in a cart. All these are signs of their weakness because they cannot access other important places. Our operations are ongoing in this regard. Efforts are underway to eliminate these people from Afghanistan. Do you think ISIS is a challenge in the current situation? Yes, there is definitely a challenge. But there's no great obstacle either, because they have no organized territory. They have no security posts and centers. They attack secretly. We are fully prepared against them. It's been a year and no one has recognized your government yet. How much of a concern is this to you? It is important that we should be recognized. So far, the relations of the international community with us are formal. We want that they should make a clear announcement and recognition. Countries that have reservations about recognizing us should discuss these issues with us so that Afghanistan, again, suffers from other problems as well as economic problems that lead to civil war. It is not in anyone's interest that we are not recognized. Rather, cooperate with us. And we will also fully cooperate with the international community. Through this, law and order economy and relations can be improved. The Taliban insists there are no links with al-Qaeda, but what about the killing of al-Qaeda chief Ayman al-Zawahiri in Kabul? We want to assure the international community and the United States that we will not allow and have not allowed the territory of Afghanistan to be used against anyone. This is our commitment. If you could explain a little more whether Ayman al-Zawahiri was present here or he was not, and is his body here or is it not? The rocket has completely destroyed its target where it landed. It is crumbled. The investigation is ongoing, after which the situation will become clear as to what happened. But so far, we see it as a claim. Finally, not only the international community, but also the people of Afghanistan are worried about the closure of girls' schools. When will they open? Work is in progress to solve the problem of schools. A reasonable Islamic solution should be found in this regard, which is acceptable to all, that they do not cause anxiety and differences. For more analysis, joining us now is Voice of America's correspondent Jessica Stones, who joins us now live from Washington, uh, D.C. Jessica, welcome to the special broadcast. My first question, the United States and NATO led an unprecedented rescue effort one year ago and 120,000 Afghans were evacuated. But what has life been like for them since, especially there in the United States? 
Well, it's been pretty difficult. Uh, I have direct experience with those that I've been trying to work with here in the United States, and some of them do not have permanent housing. They have not yet been able to find work. And, you know, these special immigrant visa holders that uh, that even got the right papers in order in order to leave the country, they are still waiting for a path to citizenship here in the United States. There is some legislation in Congress that has not yet been passed that's meant to address that situation. Uh, the military community in particular is still pushing Congress very heavily to make good on the promises that were made over the course of 20 years. Um, but more than 77,000 Afghans who applied for those SIVs are still stuck in Afghanistan. They haven't been able to make it out. Now, the White House changed the way they're bringing people to this country yesterday. They said, look, we're going to change the way we do this immigration process. And instead of focusing on temporary status for some Afghans, we are going to focus just on those who are in direct threat from the Taliban because they are trying to reunite with family members here in the United States. And we're going to try to get them here and give them some type of pathway to citizenship. So uh, it is uh, still quite something that people here in Washington and around the world I know have been reflecting on over the last uh, month uh, on all of the things that could have been done better. And one of the congressional reports that came out this month criticizing the withdrawal came from the Republicans in Congress saying that the Biden administration simply didn't plan for the withdrawal. And as evidence, they point to at least one thing that I have pulled out of the report, which is that, that only 36 consular officers were left to right. process hundreds of thousands of applications to uh, leave for visas. And, of course, many people still trying to leave. Right. Jessica, war crimes prosecutors at The Hague are asking for a prompt ruling on their request to resume investigating atrocities <clears throat> in Afghanistan. Where does that effort stand as of now? Well, the International Criminal Court had been had started an investigation into Afghan war crimes, and it has been on hold for the last two years. And the former Afghan government asked to do its own investigation first, and so that's why it's been on hold. But uh, an ICC prosecutor says, "Look, the Taliban is not going to pick up this investigation. Uh, they are not going to continue what has been started by the previous government. So we should no longer abide by this delay. We need to get this restarted." Uh, and there has been more evidence presented in the meantime. In July, the UN mission. In Afghanistan said the Taliban were responsible for extrajudicial killings since they seized power. And yet there's still no deadline for this ruling, Priyanka. Right. Uh, Jessica, thanks so much for all these inputs. Stay with us on this special broadcast. We'll come back to you for your inputs on another story. Moving on now. After Monday's scrubbed Artemis launch, NASA is now awaiting liftoff of its first mission to the moon in 50 years on Saturday afternoon. The unmanned flight is a test of its new rocket and capsule system. VOA's Kane Farabaugh reports on the excitement surrounding the Artemis program, which aims to one day send humans to Mars. You know, there's a launch today. For nearly 40 years, Brenda Mulberry has owned a space-themed clothing shop not far from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where business was slow since space shuttle launches ended in 2011. Whenever there's a launch... Like but this year, she says, is different. Yeah, excitement is over the moon. People are flocking to Mulberry's store to get anything they can related to NASA's new Artemis mission. On a normal day, we might see 60, 70 people in a day in our store and we're seeing hundreds, hundreds and hundreds an hour. <laughs> Artemis, the agency's name for its ambitious program to return to the moon, is generating renewed interest in space exploration ahead of the launch of the first unmanned test flight of the Space Launch System or SLS rocket and the Orion capsule, which will eventually carry astronauts back to the moon more than 50 years after the last Apollo mission visited the lunar surface. I call it the Artemis generation, right? So Apollo had a twin sister, Artemis, and this is our generation. Brianiel Rodriguez is an integration manager for NASA's Orion capsule, which will house the astronauts. And so I think it's a fantastic thing for us to be able to experience, to be able to go explore and really put a presence on the moon. It's amazingly cool. NASA astronaut Stan Love says the Artemis program will feature diverse crews, paving the way for the first woman and person of color to make history on the lunar surface. We don't know who's going. We are going to broaden our demographics so it won't be just white guys on the moon. NASA's goals for Artemis are not short term. The agency says it's planning for crewed missions to the moon for decades. We're gonna establish a permanent base, but I think, you know, long term, we wanna go to Mars. NASA has said, you know, this is a stepping stone to Mars eventually. Doug Hurley is a retired NASA astronaut who now works on Artemis for Northrop Grumman a government contractor specializing in aerospace and defense. 
While critics have pointed out Artemis is billions of dollars over budget and years behind schedule, Hurley says patience and expenditure will be rewarded. It takes time to build these complicated machines, but it's worth it. I mean, when you look at NASA's budget, half of 1% of the federal budget, and SLS is a small part of NASA's budget. So to me, you know, it's all perspective. Space Earth's owner Mulberry says critics of the program are hard to find on Florida's space coast. See, all those are old. She credits Artemis with boosting jobs and tourism in an area that suffered economically when the U.S. space shuttle program ended. I think everybody in this area underestimated the power this was going to have. Even though it's an unmanned test flight, when Artemis 1 takes off on a planned six-week mission, it will provide valuable data for NASA and show how new systems function in space. The first crewed mission back to the moon, to orbit but not to land, is Artemis 2, currently scheduled for 2024, with Artemis 3 scheduled to return astronauts to the lunar surface as early as 2025. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. For more inputs, we still have VOA's Jessica Stone with us on this broadcast. Jessica, thanks for staying on. Uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson says that the U.S. space program is now competing with China with a sense of urgency as tensions continue to mount between the two global powers. What's your take on the same? Well, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, pushed back on those statements earlier this week, saying, quote, outer space is no place for countries to wrestle, but an important field for win-win cooperation. That uh, term we often hear from the foreign ministry, win-win cooperation. But look, there are valuable minerals on the moon. NASA says there are things like uh, cadmium and lithium and, uh, and things that need to be used in electronics. And of course, in this global race to uh, produce more uh, electronic vehicles in particular. Uh, the race is uh, also something that Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, says, look, I don't really trust China not to get there first. And then it like, claimed all of those. So there's really a competition uh, for, uh, uh, for getting to the moon first uh, again. And Chinese media are essentially casting doubt on whether the United States can put a human on the moon. They're saying, look, you've spent so much money on your program. You still don't have someone back there. The Wang Yan uh, chief editor of Beijing uh, Aerospace Knowledge Magazine told the Global Times this week, you won't have the resources to get there by 2025 because you spent so much money on Mars exploration and the International Space Station. You just won't have the funds. Uh, so the uh, war of words continues between both countries when it comes to space. Uh, it is not out of bounds for that competition. Right, Bianca. Jessica. It's not just outer space, however, China, uh, but the U.S.-China competition is also playing out in Oceana. You've been digging into this incident uh, where the Solomon Islands denied the U.S. and British ships diplomatic clearance after signing a security agreement with Beijing. What more have you learned about the same? Well, all of this goes back to August 23rd when the U.S. State Department says that a U.S. Coast Guard cutter was denied a port call just for refueling and provisions at the port there in the Solomon Islands. And remember, earlier this year, the Solomon Islands signed a security pact with Beijing, and that led to concerns and a flurry of diplomatic activity uh, between the United States uh, and the region coming back and forth, promising more investment and the like. Uh, the reason uh, that this causes concern is that the security pact actually allows China to dock and to maintain forces at that port. So the concern being that it was therefore not going to be as welcoming to other foreign ships. Uh, the government of Solomon Islands has pushed back on the reporting that we and others have done about this, saying to us uh, earlier this week, the port call was not denied, but it was delayed because they didn't get their paperwork in in time. Now, by the time it was processed, they say that the ship had already turned around and gone to Papua New Guinea to refuel and provision there. Meantime, the Solomon Islands are refining their approval process. They say they're having a moratorium on the visits of foreign ships until they can reestablish some new protocols for foreign vessel visits. But that has not prevented this two-week-long multinational humanitarian mission that is going on, which includes the USNS Mercy, which is a hospital ship, as well as troops from Australia and from Japan. Uh, so they are taking the humanitarian help but reevaluating how and when they work with foreign ships in other instances. Priyanka. Right, Jessica, thanks so much for all those inputs. Thanks for joining us on this special broadcast on Beyond World this month.